Sigueu benvinguts i benvingudes a la seu d'Esgae Catalunya i Fundació Esgae. Em dic Sílvia i treballo aquí a la casa, Fundació. En primer lloc, disculpar la presència de l'Agnela Domínguez, que havia de presentar i obrir aquestes jornades del Festival de la Seu. Però bé, ahir era la gala d'entrega dels Premis Max, d'Arts Escèniques, i és a Madrid amb el director. Dir-vos que estem encantadíssims de col·laborar per tercera edició, tercer any consecutiu amb el Festival d'A, amb l'organització d'unes jornades a la Seu. Aquest any molt intensives al voltant dels públics, un dels pals de Paller, demà amb dues taules rodones més, i res, felicitar enormement en Carlos i a tot l'equip, Joan, públicament també ho diré, i la resta per l'organització de les jornades i del festival. Molta sort, et deixo la paraula. Gràcies, Silvia. Bé, benvinguts a tots, bon dia, benvinguts a una nova jornada del Festival Internacional de Cinema d'Autor de Barcelona, i bé, aquesta vegada, la segona edició de les jornades, l'any passat van estar dedicades al màrqueting cinematogràfic, aquest any, com ha comentat Sílvia, als públics. Bé, agrair, com sempre, a l'Europa Creativa Media Antena Barcelona per la seva col·laboració, a l'àrea de públics del Departament de la Generalitat, a l'SD, a la Fundació Esgae, agrair també tota la feina feta pel Joan i bé, esperem i desitgem que aquestes jornades almenys parlem dels públics a partir d'avui cap endemà. No fer anàlisis, intentar no fer anàlisis de què ens ha passat o què no hem fet bé, sinó que intentem donar eines per parlar de públics d'això, d'avui per endemà. Així que... Què podíem dir? Bueno, que disfruteu de les jornades i us cedeixo la paraula a l'Àlex Navarro de l'Europa Creativa Media Antena Catalunya. Gràcies, Carles. Gràcies, Sílvia. Benvinguts a tots. Queden cadires buides. Aquest espai bombonera és molt bonic, gràcies a l'ESGAE, que és un dels companys de viatge que de seguida el Carles i nosaltres vam posar a un bord. Queden seients buits perquè hi ha vaga de metro, per tant, estem intentant encongir perquè donar temps que la gent arribi, però en començarem puntualment perquè el keynote en comença a 35, només amb 5 minuts de demora. Jo he de disculpar perquè faig la benvinguda institucional, però sóc un runner-up, sóc una sèrie B. El Xavier Díaz, per problemes d'agenda, el nostre director no pot ser aquí amb nosaltres, per tant, ens cedeix, jo represento a l'equip de l'ICEC, que en aquest cas és tal com l'organització que va deixar el Jordi Selles, té la columna d'empresa, la columna de públics i la columna de mercats. I evidentment tinc els meus companys aquí, que són els companys de viatge amb els quals treballem, amb el Carlos Ríos i amb l'Esgai, per aquesta segona jornades professionals dintre del marc del DEA, que són els que avui, els motius que esteu aquí. Jo us volia explicar bàsicament què fa Mèdia a Europa Creativa per públics. És l'únic programa en aquests moments que té una línia dedicada a Audience Development, en concret amb dues modalitats, una modalitat de Media Literacy, d'educació en la imatge, i una altra de promoció de packs de pel·lícules que busquen el seu públic. I dic això perquè el tema dels públics i el tema que tractem en la jornada d'avui és un tema transversal que apareix a totes les convocatòries que tenen a veure d'alguna manera amb cultura on la cultura pot ser receptora d'ajuts europeus. El que passa és que l'única que té una línia específica és la de mèdia. Les altres puntua de manera subjectiva. Per tant, és una espècie com de test del que pot ser el programari europeu pels propers set anys veure cap on van els públics. I què fan amb aquest test? Incentivar iniciatives que analitzin que busquin mesures, que busquin dades, que incentivin, que facin l'engagement del públic, que d'alguna manera aportin dades de cap on van els diferents targets amb els seus hàbits de consum. I per això ens va semblar molt bonic que aquesta segona jornada fos dedicada als públics i per això us presentem un programa que és això, que és públic creador, públic comunitat, públic lab, i voldria felicitar el Joan Ruiz, que és el braç dret del Carles, perquè seguint unes reunions que hem fet amb la gent de l'ECD, amb la gent de públics, amb la mateixa Esgà i amb el mateix Carles, hem amanit el que avui esperem disfruteu. Per tant, res més a dir, aquesta és la propòsit de la jornada, espereu que us sigui profitós, agrair als companys de viatge novament, a l'ESGA, a l'ECD, a l'àrea de públics, i que estarem per aquí si voleu 
tot el dia comentar coses sobre audiències. Benvinguts i ara em toca presentar allò que és un redoble de tambores. It's time to introduce our keynote. We've been trying to find the best keynote at this time to uh, explain about what's going on in audiences, but not just from the audiovisual point of view, from other sectors. So it's a kind of a good opening. So please uh, give a nice welcome to Heather Mainland. This is our keynote. Welcome. And uh, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. I Quick applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I so wish I spoke Spanish. So I'm really sorry that you're having to to use these, but the lovely Janine will look after you. Janine next door will look after you very well, I'm sure. I have the best job in the world. For the past 25 years, I've been talking to audiences about why and how they engage in culture. I love it because they constantly surprise me. Um, and I've just finished looking at 5,000 cultural cinema attenders. I, I never know what to call it. Cultural cinema, specialist cinema. It's very difficult. I, I love the phrase that's just been used, cinema looking for an audience. And, and that's what we're talking about here. Um, I focus mainly on the UK and Ireland, but of course we've got lots of lovely information um, from the rest of Europe as well. So what am I going to do? I'm going to talk to you about what's happening to audiences for cinema, but also I think we need... Oh, hello. Uh, technical hitch number one. Nothing's happening. Where's the lovely Joanne gone? Oh, well. I'm going to talk to you about... Yay, fantastic. Um, I'm going to talk to you about what's happening to audiences for cinema, but also, also what's happening to audiences for culture as a whole, because I think there are lots of things that resonate. Um, I'm going to talk about mainly what can we do about it, because you know, I can look at data forever, because I'm a, I'm a data geek. But actually it's pointless unless we do something with it, so that's what today is about. So the bad news, of course, is that cinema is old, guys. Cinema is dead. If we look at uh, what's going on, on average, 221 times a day we look at that screen. Yeah? And that's, on average, 3 hours and 16 minutes. This is people from Spain. This is Spanish data. 221 times. Amazing. Now, OK, connectivity is a problem. That's, that's an issue dear to my heart because where I live, we have no broadband. Yeah, we have fields of carrots and no broadband. Um, but, but Mintel says that across Spain, um, broadband and 3G access will grow by 12% this year in Spain. That's big shift. And um, interestingly, more European audiences now watch film on their computer. I'm so standing in your way. On, on, on computer rather than uh, on a TV set. So 85% watch on their computer, 75% watch on TV. It's amazing, isn't it? Um, so cinema is dead. So why... Are cinema admissions in Europe in 2015 up? Uh, they're up in uh, overall, 8%. In Germany, they're up 14%. In the UK, up 9%. In Italy, 9%. In Spain, 8%. One country has seen a fall, and that's France, because last year was so amazingly good. That's the only reason. Um, so I have to say I'm confused. <laughs> you know, I really am confused. Um, do you do this? Uh, you've watched seven years of television in eight days, and that's never meant to happen. Do you binge watch? You guys? Yeah, no? Mm, yeah, 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 uh, absolutely. But do you do this as well? Do you, do you use Vine over here? huge in the UK and Ireland. Six second videos, literally six seconds, that's all they've got. And it's huge. 
Um, so how can we have those two things happening at the same time? And audiences watch movies like this, but we've also got lots of people watching movies like this. So how can cinema at the same time be an event and be a conversation? How can it be about distance, but also about that intimacy? How can it be all those things at once? <coughs> My problem with how people are talking about audiences and cinema at the moment is we're telling ourselves stories that are too simple. We're trying to make sense of things and saying things like cinema is dead. And it's clearly much more complicated than that. Um, I was listening to Z Frank. Uh, he's the president of BuzzFeed Motion Pictures. So, you know, he's a big player. And uh, what he said was that there are two contrasting things going on. He calls them streams because they flow. Um, You've got people who are using film, who are consuming film, as something to immerse themselves in. It's consumption. It's about forgetting everyday life. It's about immersing yourself in another extraordinary world. But also, you've got this idea of sharing film, the idea that, that, that actually it's a social thing. It's about the everyday. And people seem to choose which they want to do when. And quite often they're the same people shifting between those two streams. I was fascinated by this. This film, for the first time in the UK at least, was released on every single platform at exactly the same time. So free TV, uh, the film for subscription channels, cinema, uh, video on demand and DVD and Blu-ray all at the same time. So why had those, those stupid people sitting in the cinema paid to see this film when they could have seen it for free at home at the same time? Well, because they made a deliberate choice. The research shows that they knew it was on TV, but they wanted to experience it in the cinema. So why? Why is this idea of sitting in a special space and experiencing film so important to people? Well, there's a very prosaic answer. Did you know that 37% of Spanish 25 to 34 year olds are living at home with their parents? <laughs> yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Um, Mintel says this is going to increase. It's certainly increasing a lot in the UK. My child, thank God, is 25 now and she has left home. Yes! Um, but we're going to be more and more and more looking for entertainment of all sorts outside the home because there's not enough space, we're having to compromise with our parents' taste. There's just no room to have fun. And also, certainly in the UK, houses are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So even families are looking for their own space in which to engage. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But I think there's something more than that going on. I think it's much more complicated than that. And I think scientists have got the answer. So scientists, as they do, have been putting film audiences into brain scanners. Yeah, this idea of, of um, neurocinematics. And they've been watching what happens to people's brains while they experience film. I love the film they chose. Yeah, this was the film they chose for the big, big piece of research. Um, when people watch this movie, whoops, the same thing, exactly the same thing is happening across 45% of their brains. Yeah? So really, really, when people go to the cinema, it is about a shared experience. It's about experience. It's about belonging. 
Yeah, you're in a space where you're sharing that experience with people. And I want to talk about that thing about belonging. Um, the research that's that's just happened in Wales, which is a part of part of England, about uh, three million inhabitants, they've tried to fill in the gaps in research. And one of the gaps was, why do people go to buildings, cinemas, to see a film? And that applied to festivals as well. You know, why were they choosing particular venues um, over others? And it's really interesting because they are really, really loyal to their cultural cinema. So 30% only ever go to see cultural film in one place. And only 15% go to different places to see cultural film, even when there are more than one cinema showing cultural fi film within a 20-minute walk. They will go to one place. So why is that? Because they're certainly not loyal to multiplexes. They also, 55% of cultural film goers, also go and see, you know, American blockbusters in the multiplex, but they own and, and any multiplex. They're not loyal, but but cultural cinema, they're going to one place. So what the Welsh guys did, the people in Wales did, was that they asked people to describe their perfect cinema. It was really interesting because this is what they said. Okay, the film was important, so a wide choice of film. Isn't that interesting? Because it's not films I like, but a wide choice of films. And we'll talk about why that might be in a minute. Um, but almost as important were the staff. You know, the people selling coffee or um, the people that they met at the door who were, who were looking at their tickets. They were almost as important as the film. Food and drink was really, really important. Um, having a buzzy atmosphere. You know, that, that felt lively, that felt energising. Um, and this desire to see film with people who felt about film the same way that they did was really important. And they actually said, I belong here. I feel like I belong here. They wanted to be in a place where they felt they belonged. Now, I was really interested in this. They didn't make this connection, which surprised me, but this is really, really like third place theory. That's a theory that started with community architecture, and it's about what kind of places bring communities together. It's about the people. It's about the staff. It's about the welcome. It's about belonging. And the food and drink is important because food and drink make something social. So let's talk a bit about third place theory. Um, our first place is at home, but we can't be ourselves because we're forced to be mother or father or sister or whatever. Our second place is work, and we certainly can't be ourselves there. We're too busy having to be the accountant or the marketing manager or whatever it is. Third place theory says that we are all, since about the 50s, the 1950s, we are all looking for a place where we can be our ideal self. We can be the person we would love to be. And also we can be around other people who are like our ideal selves. It's about social space. It's about belonging. So I, did, I, I was really interested by this, and I went and I talked to some audiences in my local cultural cinema. Locals stretching it. It's about 40 minutes away because I live in a very rural area. Um, and uh, this is Susan. Susan is at this venue not because of the film. She's not making decisions based on the film. She sees a lot of films, but she goes to film on her own and to music or to, to theatre with other people. But, but cinema is about her. And she very, very rarely goes anywhere else. And she goes to this place um, because she feels comfortable. Now, I was surprised she said that because what she's seeing is a very, very long, very, very miserable Russian film called The Banishment. Yeah. 
but she's she's just going because it's her her third place. Her favorite film, I love this. Her favorite film, even though she's really into French cinema d'auteur, her favorite film, Some Like It Hot. Yeah. And so there's something really interesting going on. I, w I, I was thinking, does this happen online as well? And there's just been some research <coughs> looking at whether you can have third places online. And kind of yes, but not all online communities are third, third places because it's got to be neutral. It's got to be a neutral place where everybody's kind of like equal. And it's got to be accessible. And a lot of a lot of third uh, a lot of online communities are closed. You know, and it's about people looking inward and talking to each other. But the ones that are accessible and neutral can be third places. So, cinema is about belonging. It's about social things. And. Suddenly, the focus has shifted away from the screen, hasn't it? Because if people are engaging with cinema for social reasons, the place becomes really, really important, and the other people sitting around them has become really, really important. And it's like we've just suddenly turned 180 degrees to look the other way. Really strange things happen in people's brains when they look at moving image. So researchers have fixed lights to people's wrists and elbows and shoulders and heads, hips, knees, ankles. So they then film those people moving and all you can see are the lights. Can you tell what this person is doing? I mean, it's, it's freeze frame. Can you tell what they're doing? No, they're doing a, a cat jump, yeah? Isn't it weird with how little information you can tell what's going on? This only happens with movement. People can watch movement with this little information and they can tell you whether that person is male or female or how they're feeling what their motivation is for doing whatever it is that they're doing. They can't do it with static, still images. So there's something really interesting going on. The scientists think it's about evolution. You know, you, you need to be able, our ancestors needed to be able to tell if that person coming up was going to hug them or kill and eat them. You know, so, so, so we need to be able to tell from the movement whether they're feeling huggy or, or you know, a, a sort of homicidal. So it's interesting that this happens very strongly with, with, with film as well. This is the good, the bad and the ugly again. People look at the same area of the screen when the film is created by a director. Created. They don't do that at all with moving image that's random, say from um, a CCTV, closed circuit television. That doesn't happen at all. So this is, this is what happens... Whoop, this is what happens with um, CCTV. So when we create film, we're, we're, we're actually creating that shared emotional social experience because we're actually doing something that controls the gaze that con and controls the emotions. So it's kind of, kind of important, isn't it? Um, so if cinema is a shared immersive experience, what's important about that shared immersive experience is that shared emotion that brings everybody together. And we're, we're at the moment, we're looking for ever more exciting, immersive experiences. You know, 3D is no longer enough. 5D, 6D, even 7D. I've, I've, I only found up to 7 at the moment, but who knows how many Ds we'll get. But what fascinates me is this is nothing new. 
right from the early, early days of cinema, we've been talking to audiences about immersive experiences. So this is Cinerama, and it says, uh, you are in the picture. Whoa, immersive experience. And um, thrill after thrill, you dodge, duck, and squirm. Shock after shock. Isn't it interesting? Sod what's on the screen. What all they're talking about is the emotional, immersive experience. Um, there's even a Romarama. I love this. Yeah. See it, hear it, and smell it. Um, or sense around. Uh, earthquake. What fascinates me, though, is that it actually says in this advert, you'll never experience it on TV. So already, even as early as this, people were talking about the, the difference between the shared experience and, and the, the, the lonely, unemotional experience of watching a film on TV with a bucket of ice cream, which is what I do. And lots of people are engaging like this, but lots of people are engaging in this, sh whoops, in this sharing idea as well. So let's, let's shift gear. Let's look at this other stream. This is the second of C. Frank's streams that he talked about. You know, shareable cinema versus consumable cinema. And if consumable cinema is about immersive experiences in special places that are special events, well, shareable cinema is about the everyday. It's about cinema being part of everyday life. Hugh Gary says what it is is about call and response. Yeah? So it's about a conversation, really. It's an exchange. And loads of people do this as well. The, the, the um, European research that's just uh, end of last year was published um, shows that in Spain, um, people who used social media to talk about film, 45% of respondents, yeah, big samples. 60% uh, said that they would uh, look at a trailer if their friend on Facebook likes it. Um, and this is the one that really gobsmacks me. 49% have created and shared their own material about film. Kind of not really defined what created and shared means, but I'd, I'd like to know a bit more about, about what people interpreted that as, but that is pretty extraordinary, isn't it? But I have to say, this isn't new either. Sorry, guys. You know, even as early as the 20s, uh, cinema audiences wanted to be on the other end of the camera. Yeah, they wanted to create their own work. Um, and this is an, an, an American ad, but it was also happening in the UK as well. Um, some of my colleagues are researching this at the moment. And interestingly, they weren't just taking holiday movies. They weren't just recording their lives and their friends and family and their location. They were creating fiction. So even at that point, participation and engagement was on both sides of the camera. I'm fascinated that Z. Frank's research um, looked at why do people share a film. You know, when you, when you share something, you have the opportunity to make a statement about why you've shared it. He analysed, oh, hundreds of thousands of these share statements. Three things. Number one, film explains who you are better than you can. So people were looking at film, recognising themselves or friends and family, recognising other people, and sharing it as a way of saying, oh, this is so you, this is so me. Um, I'm also interested about this idea of giving people emotional gifts. So they were, they were saying, you know, I, I, I cried at this, or, or, oh, wow, look, kittens, oh, and I'm giving you this emotion, because I know you'll feel that too. And then cinema as a way of carrying on a conversation that you're having in everyday life. You know, ha, look at this, I was right when I said the other day, da 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 da, here it is, no. <laughs> that kind of thing. So all of these share statements 
are about communicating how we feel. So we've got emotion again being really, really important. So what? I mean, you know, I'm giving you all this lovely information, but so what? Well, actually, we've got to find a way of responding. Um, young people in particular are doing this. And it does seem to be about identity. So young people are using film to create identity, to, sh to show that they belong to a group, but also really importantly to show how they are different to everybody else. Um, I'm let you into a secret. I'm a Morris dancer. I do English traditional dance. This is, this is really strange in the UK, and you know, Morris dancers are not popular, except we've got all these 16, 17, 18-year-olds joining our group, and I think they're doing it to say to, to their, their friends, I'm different, you know? I, I, I refuse to engage with your popular culture. I am, you know, someone who's different and better than you. So, and also to annoy their parents, because I've got all these parents, because I'm responsible for the young people. Um, all these parents going, what? <laughs> so, yeah, so, so this idea of difference is really important. And the interesting thing is that top-down culture, culture that they're given and presented with and shown, doesn't do this at all. It's seen as irrelevant, it's seen as unattractive, and because it's irrelevant, they feel excluded from it. So, how can we respond to this? Well, for the first time, we've actually got the ability to listen. For the first time since cinema left the music halls and went into the proper grown-up, cinema spaces and then became admissions. They were audiences. They did have an engagement and an exchange and suddenly they became admissions. They became just numbers. They stopped being people. But for the first time since then, we've got the ability to hear how our audiences want to engage. Our trouble is that we see Social media is a way of telling people things. It's not. It's a way of listening. So, I'm fascinated by this movie. Have you, have you come across Frank? It's very British. But really interesting because um, it was commissioned by uh, Film 4 and they wanted to use it as an opportunity to explore different ways of telling stories. So, it was preceded by a huge social media campaign that was the prequel to this movie. It took audiences through the story of one of the main characters up until the point where the movie starts. And the, the character is continually engaged in, in social media in the movie. So they followed his life um, uh, through, through that process bef you know, before the film. And what was interesting was that Hugh Gary, who was the guru who, who created all of this um, with, the, with the film's director, said that what I wanted to do was listen and respond. So he created a whole load of content, but a lot of it he didn't present until it was asked for. He even said to, to audiences, uh, to, to, to yeah, audiences, I suppose, um, what do you want the characters do, to do? And then he would choose some content from his, his stock and present it as, as almost instantly as a, as a call and response. It's amazing, isn't it? Really, really important was a series of tools that allowed uh, the, the participants to create their own content. So there was a meme generator that was used really heavily. But the big thing was the album generator, because one of the, the, the character we're following creates the world's worst album and shares it. And uh, 1,200 people made and shared an album. And for each of those albums, five people clicked through to the website on average. So, so big audience for it. They're still looking at it, even though this was over a year ago. 18 months later, people are still engaging with the story and following it through. 
Um, so social media means that we're looking at people and not numbers. We're looking at why they want to engage and respond. I want to talk a bit about why I, I was throwing hissy fits about this idea of admissions. You know, I'm a data geek. I deal with that kind of data a lot. But actually, I don't think it's very helpful. You will need a pen. And you will need a piece of paper. Yeah? Grab a pen and a piece of paper now. We're going to do a quiz. We've, got, we've got, got this thing in the UK about pub quizzes. Do you, do you have that kind of thing, pub quizzes, where you know, an awful lot of people get together on a Friday evening and do a quiz in the pub with pints of beer and mm, huge in the UK. We're going to do, do a pub quiz. What I want you to do is I'm going to ask you some questions. Can you write the answer really big? It'll be a number. And, and so that I can read it from here. So what I'll do is ask you the question, give you a couple of seconds to write what you think the answer is. Guess. That's what we do in pub, guess, uh, pub quizzes. We guess most of the time. And then show me, show me what you've written. And I'll just, I'll just uh, read them out. Cool. So question number one. What percentage of the Spanish population say they do not watch film? What percentage of the Spanish population say they do not watch film? Write it really nice and big for me, and then when I say, hold it up for me. And I'm going to start at the back, guys. Cool. So, hold it up. Hold it up for me. So, we've got uh, 5, 20, 42, none, 10, none. Uh, 70, 30, 12, 10, 20, 15, 15, 3, 2, 10, 46, 10, 20, 60, 10, 15, 53, 10, 40, whoa, 40, 35, none, 2, 38, 10, 20, 12, 10, 20, 10, 15, 10, no, uh, 3, Whoa! <laughs> wow! That is spooky. So we're going from like naught <laughs> to 60. Or was it 70? Wow! It's <laughs> interesting. Some of you had so the right answer. Okay, next one. What percentage of cinema goers in Spain say, I love cinema and I'm a cinema fan? Write it nice and big again. I'm going to start at the front this time, but guys at the back, have a guess. Whoa, 70, 90, 80, 60, 95, 6. Ooh. 15, 73, 20, 80, 45, 25, 22, 24, 60, 40, 60, 60, woo! At 20, 90, 80, 50. I love that. I can see, I can so see that on your tablet. 10, oh no, 80, 30, 40, 45, 85, 50, 80, 40, 40, 90, 90? At 40, 50, have you got one? 70, 70 cool. <laughs> 70, 15, wow, I, I can't see that, sorry. 30, 30, <laughs> whoa, ho, ho. wow. I think we went from sort of 95, didn't we, to um, not quite as far, but nearly as far, 15. Isn't that interesting? Scary. I'm scared. Whoa. That's the answer. Some of you were so spot on. Was that luck or have you read the research? Um, what percentage said they like film but are more interested in other art forms? Um. 
They like film, but they're more interested in other art forms. Okay, wave it in the air. 90, 60, 30, 50, 50, 60, 50, 40, 15, 20, 10, 40, 20, 20, 15, 25, 30, 10, 60, 10, 60, 10, 40, 50, 17, 15. Oh, I like 17. That's really precise. 55, 40, 15, 30, 70, wave it again, I missed you, 60, 35, 30, 60, 3, 20, 25, I missed it, so to wave it for me again, I missed it, uh, 20, 10, 10, 40, 15, 10, 20, I'm not going to do this thing again because I'm getting tired. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I mean, lots of people say, I'm a cinema fan, but slightly more say, yeah, they like film. It's not their main thing, but they like film. Yeah, interesting. We're going to do two more. What percentage of cinema goers in Spain see film in cinemas? Forty. Ooh, there's a lot of there's conferring going on in a pub quiz. That would mean absolutely you'd get disqualified. Thirty, thirty, forty, fifty, thirty, fifty-nine, eighty, twelve, forty, twenty, twenty-five, twenty, forty, twenty, twenty-seven, thirty-five, twenty-five, forty-eight, twenty, thirty, twenty. 60, 15, 30, 10, 20, 20, 30, 40, 10, 40, 20. Whoa! So even though you were conferring this time, we've, I've still got to run backwards and forwards across the room. Wow! You were all wrong! You were all wrong! Isn't that amazing? They like it. They lie. No, they don't lie. Actually, they don't lie. What, what's happening is you've got loads and loads and loads and loads of people who go occasionally. So we ha we'll talk about this in a minute, but that's what's happening. It's about frequency. They do it, but just not very often. And what percentage said they went at least once a week? I'm not going to make you do this again. I'm going I'm to tell you this one. <laughs> That's what it's about. It's about frequency. Now, that was interesting, wasn't it? Because we have in our heads such very, very, very different pictures of the audience. Because what we look at is admissions. And we can't see the people behind the admissions. This is a great piece of research, by the way. It's worth looking at. It's 800 pages long but you only have to read the bit about Spain. <laughs> um, what happens if we are guessing too low? If we think that, that loads of people do not watch film, that l very few people go frequently, that very few people see film in cinemas, what happens when we start thinking about audiences? It's a genuine question. Somebody, somebody tell me. Whoa. Put the thingy on. Sorry, Janine, I didn't warn you. What happens, do you think? <coughs> yep, I can hear, I can hear. You're lovely, Janine, thank you. She's going, testing, testing. <laughs> <laughs> what happens? Somebody, somebody give me... So you think that... You think that very, very few people see film in cinemas, that lots of people don't watch film? That we are depressed. You're depressed, <laughs> aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not worth bothering with our audiences because 
there's no point because they don't appreciate what we do. <laughs> what, what happens if we're, we're over here, though, you know, and we believe that everybody sees film and that everybody goes frequently and that everybody sees film in cinemas? What happens? <laughs> yeah, you're really depressed as well. <laughs> Because your expectations can never, ever, ever be fulfilled. You think you don't have to try because everybody loves what we do and then they don't come. So, so actually, both ways, it's pretty depressing. Thank you, Janine, that's lovely. Um, both ways, it's pretty depressing. We have to understand the people. And is Sylvia here who's going to be talking next? Yeah, this is why what you are about to talk to about is really, really, really important. And you're so lucky to, to have this, this research to look at because we've got to understand people. When we treat audiences for film as people, we realise how different they are, how diverse they are. Yeah, oh, they're dogs, but they're hardly similar, are they? That's the, the word is all they have in common, bless them. My driver last night spent the journey from the airport talking about his two dogs. Um, people want different things. So what are they like? This is, this is my research, and what was fascinating was in the UK, in, in Wales, in Ireland, and in a couple of other countries where I've looked at the research, audiences are very similar, but very different. So audiences for cultural cinema are not like audiences for mainstream cinema. They really are not. Um, they're much less likely to be under 24, much less likely. They're much more likely to be over 45. They're more likely to be female. And actually, this is where I got suspicious, because they're looking very like audiences for the arts. So audiences, the profile of audiences for cultural cinema are much more like audiences for the arts than they are audiences for cinema. Now, I haven't, I haven't got any Spanish research about this. I'd love to know whether this is true, and maybe Sylvia's going to tell us. <gasps> um, that's because they really, really, really are arts attenders. Ireland is really rural, so they have lots of cultural cinemas that also do other things. So dance, theatre, workshops, all sorts of different things. And on, we can see what they do, because we've got really, really good data about exactly what all those people buy tickets for. And this is 3,000 people. So half of the tickets they bought were for film. The other half were for lots and lots of other things. It's amazing, isn't it? They're cultural cinema attenders, but only half of their attendances are for film. Now, that, that, that ranged, so at this venue, it did maybe one film a month and lots and lots of other things, so 24% of their tickets were for film. But in this venue where they did lots and lots of film and a few other things like digital media and some very strange dance, 68% um, of their tickets were, were for film. So it does, does vary, but those are the extremes that I found. So they are... Arts audiences. So when I went and talked to those audiences for you, this is Tom. Bless him. Tom's not interested in movies at all. Tom is classical music audience, and he goes at least once a month to classical music. Um, he doesn't travel far, but the only reason why he's seeing The Banishment is because it's a Tuesday. And tomorrow is his day off. And he so is not interested in film that he couldn't even tell me what his favourite film was. So 
literally, he is engaging with that building. It's where he feels he belongs and he doesn't care what he's looking at because he knows everything there will be interesting and engaging and he's open to everything. And, and one of those things is cinema. And wow, I so did not expect someone like that to, to choose to come and see The Banishment. He's literally, he is literally open to any experience that this place can offer. So he's part of that, that group, that 42% who say, I like film, but I prefer other art forms. I go more often to other art forms. What we need to do maybe is look at the 40% who say, I love film. On average, in Ireland and in Wales, those people who say, I love film, are seeing four cultural films a year. They're saying, I love film, but the four, that's all they're seeing on average. Now, of course, there are lots of people seeing more than that, but there are loads and loads and loads of people seeing just one cultural film. So I thought, OK, let's look at the people who are seeing more films than average. And guess what? They're really, really, really different. So this is Angela. I love Angela. She sees more than one film a week. Bless her, usually on her own. Um, and uh, she sees every film, even if she doesn't think she's going to like it. Guess what her favourite film was? <laughs> Mamma Mia. I was gobsmacked. <laughs> oh. So even someone who's a classic film enthusiast can really, really, really surprise you. So there are different types of film enthusiasts. This is a UK piece of research. I couldn't, I couldn't find anything like this from elsewhere in Europe. They found three sorts of film enthusiasts. These are people who consume a lot of film in cinemas. So they were the professionals. In Wales, they turned out to be about 10% of the audience. Um, but but that, was a, that was a separate piece of research following this up. But then you had a group of specialist film enthusiasts. And they were the kind of people that, that you thought, I thought at least, um, would be how I imagined film enthusiasts to be. But they're not. They have really, really strong preferences, strong likes and dislikes. And what they'll do is they'll follow the bit they like. They know everything there is to know about the bit they like. And everything else is not important. And they don't bother to find out. They're really, really, really difficult to persuade to go and see anything that's outside their enthusiasms, that, that narrow load of, load of cinema that they think is important. But this next lot, the scattergun enthusiasts, love new things. That's what they're doing. They don't know anything about it. They're just going for a new experience. So they just love to discover new films. And they deliberately find things they know nothing about. They're the arts attenders. They're the people who have a really busy cultural life that includes film as part of all of that. So we've got, we've got a big problem. We used to think about admissions. We used to think about the audience. But actually, it turns out that we've got lots and lots and lots of small, different audiences, <coughs> niche audiences, who are going for different reasons, who are motivated by different things, who have a different understanding of what we do. God, that's hard, isn't it? Having to talk to lots and lots of different audiences in different ways. Except that now we have the tools to do that. We don't have to rely on newspaper ads. We can listen and respond. We can talk to different audiences in different ways. Although, actually, I have a, some question marks about whether most of the social media that happens in the UK actually sells tickets. But that's a discussion for later, I think, this afternoon. So, I think we've got some interesting things going on. If we look at... 
what all this means. These are my so what's, you know, all this information. So what? Um, actually, I've got, I think we need to rethink. I used to think, and I wrote a book about it uh, 20 years ago. God, I'm old where I believed there were barriers. They were psychological, social, physical, financial barriers to engagement in culture and cinema. And if you took away that barrier, people would come. I don't believe that anymore, because audiences have been telling me I'm really, really wrong. Now, it's difficult to understand what they're saying. Because actually, if you say, what stops you going to cinema? They say this. And this is true in Spain, it's true in the UK, it's true in Ireland. I'm not interested in film. I don't have time. And it costs too much. And most researchers, I think, stop the conversation there. But I was really intrigued because they're really odd statements to make, because when you take away those barriers, they still don't come. And if you probe, if you, if you ask them more, to talk to you more about all of these things, it turns out that actually lack of interest means lack of relevance. So relevance is about their history, their interests, their identity. And they don't see cinema as relevant because they don't see cinema as about them and for them. Lack of time, oh, is about relevance because it's about what's worth spending time in this busy life that you think you lead because it turns out they don't. Or, or, or at least they deliberately make themselves feel busy because it makes them feel valued. I've got loads of research about that as well if anybody's interested is about what's worth spending time on. And cost is about what's worth spending money on. It, because of that lack of relevance, people don't think that cinema, non-attenders don't think that cinema is worth that admission fee. Except, and big, big except, for low-income groups where cost really, really, really is an issue. If you drop the price for everybody apart from low-income groups, they think the film is even less relevant because it can't be any good. Audiences are weird. So, I think that's got some really important messages for us. The potential for growth for cinema is actually not with the enthusiasts who are already going twice a month. It's with the people who are, feel that they are cinema enthusiasts but are only going four times a year. It's with general arts attenders persuading them that film is relevant to them and that they should dip into it more. And it's about the multiplex audience because I was really surprised how little difference there was. Um, that, that I, I imagine that the cultural film audience refused point blank to go to multiplexes with all that popcorn and all those people talking through the film and so on. So we really, really have got to rethink what we, what we say to audiences. We can't assume knowledge. We have to remember about all that third place thing and tell them why it's worth seeing cinema in our places where they will belong. It's about listening to our audiences and having a conversation with them, as well as just telling them what's on. I love the Facebook posts where you've got audiences just having a conversation, and every now and again, the, the film organisation goes, oh, look, we've got a film. And they're completely ignored. Oh, look, we've got another <coughs> film. Oh, you'll never guess what we've got next week. We've got a film. And just not engaging at all with the audience's conversation. But it is difficult because we're going to have different conversations with different audiences. This idea of lots and lots of niche audiences is really important because when I talk to audiences, certainly in the UK, they are actively prevented from coming by what we say about film. We actively put them off. And above all, what we have to do 
is make film relevant <coughs> to more people. So, yay, cinema is not dead, you know? The uh, rapidly changing technology and, and, and ways of, of, of experiencing cinema is, has been happening since the very beginning, you know, for 100 years. It's about two parallel streams at the moment, and I guess our job about creating relevance is getting those two streams to cross. Oh, that's a Ghostbusters moment. Crossing those streams, whoa. Um, yeah, because when we cross those streams, actually we're creating relevance and we're breathing life into cinema. Thank you very much for, for listening, but above all, thank you very much for taking part. Thank you. Thank you.